Welcome to Critique 713. Uh, today, uh, we return to Adorno and his late work, Negative Dialectics, uh, from 1966, in conversation with Martin Saar, professor of social philosophy here at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. We were here together a year ago, uh, almost to the day, uh, discussing Adorno's late writings on theory and praxis, especially his marginalia to theory and practice, as well as Marcuse's one-dimensional man in the context last year of uh, Praxis 1313. In that discussion, we drew on Adorno's distinction between the two poles of philosophy on the one side and action on the other, and discussed at length Adorno's insistence on maintaining a realm of autonomy for both. His insistence that theory not be collapsed into practice, nor the reverse, that practice not be collapsed into theory, but that we retain an independence to critical thought uh, in order to allow us to continue to pose questions, to doubt, and to problematize our practices. Adorno's ambition, we saw last year, was not to integrate the two poles or find a way to subsume one into the other or to reconcile the tension, uh, but rather to let the tension, to let the friction live on in a kind of perpetuity. And without saying as much explicitly, without calling it by that name, we were in fact discussing the negative dialectic, uh, at least in one instantiation in the relationship between theory and practice. Adorno opposed both action for action's sake and theory for theory's sake. In other words, he opposed the absolute autonomy of either pole. He refused as well the integration or subsumption of one pole to the other, or the privileging even of one over the other. And instead, he maintained steadfastly for the continuous confrontation of one against the other and vice versa on the belief that they are inextricably related in a dialectical relationship that does not end, that does not resolve, and that cannot easily be solved. It doesn't disappear, and if it does, it's to our detriment. Now, from last year and from Praxis 1313, I think I ultimately began to embrace that view of the relationship between theory and practice. Uh, even if I resisted the sensibility associated with Adorno's positioning with regard to the student movement of the late 1960s. In other words, at a theoretical level, I was comfortable, I even adopted the position of a continual confrontation, even if at the practical level, I remained more, I feel, more understanding, more compassionate, more forgiving, and myself more invested in the urge for action and for the action imperative. But the important point uh, for us this evening and for purposes of our seminar um, is that we were right at the heart of the negative dialectic last year. Um, and in this sense, we're really continuing a conversation uh, this evening. And of course, I would urge anyone uh, who um, uh, wants to, to return to that conversation from last year as a theoretical foundation uh, for this evening. So we are continuing here also, in another sense, the conversation uh, that we began at the beginning of uh, Critique 1313 earlier this year with Axel Honneth reading the early Adorno of the Actuality of Philosophy from 1931. Now you'll recall that in that uh, inaugural lecture, uh, Adorno took as his point of departure a, a radical break in philosophy. Um, contemporary philosophy, Adorno argued, could no longer aspire to understand the world in its totality. The actual could not be rendered fully rational. The systemic and total theories of earlier German idealism were things of the past. Philosophy, Adorno wrote uh, in 1931, must learn to renounce the question of totality. Now, in the text we're reading this evening, Negative Dialectics, Adorno really begins at the very same place that he left us uh, in 1931. From the start, uh, 
uh, Adorno is, is uh, it begins from the position that philosophy is beyond the time uh, when it believed or could believe uh, in the systemizing, uh, systematizing of the world and how to transform it. Uh, the philosophical ambition of uniting and standing above all sciences proved illusory. The idea that we could perfectly understand social reality or that we could identify it as rational uh, no longer is imaginable. It was there that Adorno left us in 1931 and where we left Adorno uh, at the beginning of this uh, seminar series uh, with Axel Honneth, uh, but there's complete continuity from that essay to the negative dialectics. And there's, a, well, or we'll try and figure that out in part. Um, uh, there's so much continuity, in fact, that the American philosopher uh, Susan Buck Morse, in her important book on the origin of negative dialectic from 1977, goes so far as to write uh, that it is, quote, tempting to suggest that Adorno may have had the 1931 lecture before him when he was writing the introduction to negative dialectics. So great is the affinity of their philosophical intent. And uh, what Buck Morse argues uh, in her book is that the earlier essay essentially evolved uh, into uh, the negative dialectic. Uh, now, um, you will recall that uh, it, it would evolve in a particular way by fleshing out uh, what the negative dialectic is. Um, while back in 1931, and also at the beginning of this book, Adorno is clear and urges philosophers to eschew totalities and focus on middle-level concepts, uh, such as the commodity form or the, or the concept of the class, Adorno nevertheless retains confidence in dialectical reason back in 1931. Um, he writes uh, back then, only dialectically, it seems to me, is philosophical, in, is philosophic interpretation possible. Um, the dialectic method he maintained then remained the only way possible to move forward for a philosophy of interpretation. Of course, the question then was what exactly he meant by dialectic, and it was not entirely clear uh, from the essay in 1931. And it's fair to say that Adorno dedicated his life uh, to this question. Um, through years of exchange with Horkheimer, with Benjamin, other members of the Frankfurt School, through his lifelong engagement with Hegel's writings, um, this question was at the forefront. And I think it is this question uh, that really uh, is, is, is answered uh, in this work. So it's to this, these later texts that we turn now, um, the final writings on the dialectic, in order to explore both uh, his method, his answer, and what uh, we might call the productivity of negativity. Now, in my introductory post on the uh, Critique 713 blog, I sketched some of the elements that I view as important in Adorno's development of the concept as a way at least to begin the conversation and clarify some concepts. But I suggested that it was uh, presumptuous uh, to do that. And, uh, and so uh, with that in mind, I'd like to turn to Martin Saar first uh, to put his views uh, on the table. We are, after all, at Adorno's Institute today, and you are, after all, an expert on Adorno's thought. Uh, you hold the chair in social philosophy uh, that both Habermas and Honneth held, and that uh, Horkheimer as well held for a short period at the university here at Frankfurt. You've authored several books uh, at the intersection of these specific issues, uh, including Genealogy as Critique, published in 2007, and The Imminence of Power, uh, published in 2013. So let me first turn to you, Martin, uh, to shed some light on Adorno's negative dialectic, um, I kind of view this session of this seminar almost as my trek, a bit perhaps like the search for the Holy Grail, uh, to get some clarity on Adorno's negative dialectic and to obtain some further indications on how it can help us both to understand our current crises and to guide us or inform our praxis today. So. Thank you, Martin, for joining me. Thank you. And, um, yeah, this is a I'm pleasure. I'm, I'm very honored and really pleasure to welcome you again at this institute. Um, 
to reach out to the New York and worldwide audience we might have, maybe even already tonight. Um, since we are here at this specific site, let me just start on a more intellectual historical note. As you all know, or most of you will know, Adorno died in the summer of 1969, so this is the 50th anniversary of his death, and this has been the occasion of quite a lot of events we had here in Frankfurt. We have an ongoing series on his philosophical thought, and in a way, these very late texts are very much on people's minds at the moment for that reason, but also, I think, for systematic reasons. So let me start with the two very, very late, almost the final texts of Adorno's critique from 1969 and resignation from 1969 talks he penned more or less in the spring of 1969. And since we know that the official philosophical position probably is laid down in the negative dialectics from 1966, it might make sense to just as a thought experiment view these two late texts as something not, not as the last word, so his death was sudden, but as one of the possible late or last perspectives on his own philosophical legacy while he was defending his own role as a public intellectual in uh, the Federal Republic of Germany at the moment. And there's something, I think, extremely fascinating in terms of intellectual history, or political history even, if you look at these two texts, both of which have an apologetic side, so a defensive side, mm -hmm. because you can really feel him being kind of shy and being also kind of indignated. So he wants to defend himself and wants to defend what he is doing as a professor and as a philosopher. And he feels that they, he's cornered from two sides. And interestingly enough, it's not just the one side that he feels pressured by the student movement, mainly also by many of his students, and Karl maybe was the most famous of them, who was part of the Frankfurt SDS at the time, but many, many more. And biographically, we know also the personal relations to these people. So he is pressured by the activist wing of the student movement. And this is something we also were discussing when we were discussing the marginalia. He is pressured to, in a way, establish himself the close and direct link between theory and practice that, in a way, was one of the hallmarks of the Marxist and the neo-Marxist tradition. And in the second text, Resignation, he seems to say, no, we have to pause and we are not allowed to establish a too immediate link or transition from the one to the other, but there is a space for resisting or resistant theory that in a way pauses before it in itself realizes itself in practice. And this just seems to say that me, I don't know, not me, as a philosophy professor, cannot be expected to be the revolutionary myself or himself. But there is a place for something like proto-revolutionary or critical philosophy that in a way would prepare the transitions, but would not, let's say, step into it. And he seems to say that it's a wrong, too immediate kind of connection that might be drawn and that the pressure to be become a revolutionary oneself or to erase the separation or the border between theory and practice is in itself a conceptual, a philosophical error or mistake. And the text called Resignation seems to defend that ground. And the place on which he is standing is pretty narrow. It's not saying, no, I'm just doing philosophy or I'm just doing humanities or I'm just being a professor. It means thinking the transition to practice is not in itself, in a way, doing the transition or in a way, being practical or acting, but it's this one tiny step before where critical reflection, also critical self-doubt, is allowed and has to flourish. And that's an interesting point because, of course, as we all know, Adorno was pretty sympathetic towards the student movement. Not so much so as Marcuse and much more so than Horkheimer, but still, more or less, he seemed to think at the time that this movement, like other strands of the 68 movement in the other countries, 
we're doing the right thing in demanding democratization and demanding the opening of society and the breaking up of conventional and mores and, let's say, barriers and social taboos. And it is not that the social movement is not right in claiming that this might involve or include some pretty drastic measures. And even on the political side, the late Adorno probably was no socialist in the strict sense, but at least he was open to the idea that late capitalism cannot have the last word. But he seemed to defy or resist the idea that out of theory of philosophy itself, this transition to practice or transition to, let's say, revolutionary practice is or revolutionary politics is in itself possible or even helpful. And he seemed to think that the role of the intellectual or the role of the theoretician or the role of the philosopher is a different one, namely being the intellectual conscience of a movement or being an outsider to the movement while being sympathetic to it. And this is an interesting hesitant position or attitude, pretty much, by the way, mirroring the late Foucault's idea, never do politics, as he said in his 1978 lectures. Interestingly enough, something you would not expect from Foucault to say. But it seems to me a similar sentiment or similar attitude at that time. And so it's just interesting to note that even a theorist, even a philosopher insisting on the close interrelation or dialectical relationship between theory and practice, for himself reserves to right to remain, not purely, but mainly theoretical. And that there is something philosophically indecent, one might even say, insincere, in trying to evade that hesitation or not allow for that, in a way, room to maneuver in the realm of thought itself. Having said that, there is still another, a second opposition Adorno is insisting on, and this is the other text on critique, where he seems to say, many people accuse me of being purely negative, and he says, and I am. And this is not a problem, because also the relationship between the positive or the negative, or positivity and negativity, is in itself full of tangents and full of, let's say, conflict. And it could be that a theory that insists on the negative or the critical is not in itself forced to make the transition to the constructive or the positive. <coughs> and when he talks of the compulsion to be positive, <coughs> something I guess that rings even more true to the American ear, he just says is that the intellectual or the theoretician or the philosopher, as in, this in the first case, also has a room to reserve and has a room to stay on, which is not already compromised by, let's say, the reality principle or by the idea that you have to have the best reform idea or that you have to have a good suggestion of how things could be otherwise after you have criticized them. So he is, again, insisting on a space, <coughs> on a room, which might be small, but it is the small of thinking, let's say, where the purely or mainly negative can flourish. And you should, that's something he seems to say, you should protect that space from the urge to be practical, constructive, or positive at the same time. <coughs> and this, of course, is a criticism <coughs> he's fending off that is not necessarily coming from the same side as the first criticism. So this is not the SDS pressuring him to, in a way, put up or set up <coughs> a reform program. So these are the more realistic, <coughs> and we might even say more bourgeois-minded critics that say a critical theory cannot remain negative in its basic thrust, but it should at least compromise itself, or at least, in a way, allow itself, or it should dare to compromise or to build compromises with a certain realization or practice, and in a way, an attempt to build a better world. And I have to say, I pretty much understand the second stance too. The idea that a critic of society is necessarily forced or compulsed in a way to engage in making things better and even in a way provide blueprints is something like a dead end. And I can see the idea that 
a critical or negativistic theorist defends the space in which it makes sense to remain critical or negative, cost it as much as it will. And so we have a defensive Adorno on two sides. So he's resisting the urge, in a way, to collapse, you already said that, collapse theory into practice. But he also is calling us to resist the urge to give up or give up on the negative too easily in order to make contributions to a positive, better future or better society. And I have to say, if there is something specific about critical theory in the Adornian sense, it's probably this double hesitation. That means thinking vis-a-vis -vis the better society and political practice, but not in itself doing it, enacting it, or prefiguring it, but insisting on this one step or this little space before that. And this might be the little threshold of critique or negativity. And this is something that has to be defended, because society and also the political comrades try to force you into compromising, let's say, the purity of the negative or the purity of the theoretical, already with demands of reality, of realizability, or what have you. When we were discussing Marcuse and Adorno last year, we were connecting it to the climate crisis and Latour, as you recall. Mm -hmm. And even concerning this, uh, this uh, topic, to me it makes sense with Adorno to defend a space where you don't have to have or provide or uh, put on the table the better idea, the better program, or the, the program to a better future. Sometimes it makes sense insisting on radical or even extreme negativity. And this would be my keyword for, let's say, maybe the second half of our session when we talk about the beginning and also the end of negative dialectic, which is, let's say, a thinking of and with the extreme. So, but as far as the first mm -hmm. two texts I wanted to talk about go, mm -hmm. this is what I have to say mm -hmm. as a start. Good. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about those first two texts, uh, Critique and Resignation, before, oh. then, before uh, you entering in on negative dialectics. In part because um, what I find so interesting at the end of Resignation, in the last paragraph, mm. um, is the way in which he does make such a bold and strong argument for the productivity of negative thought, right? Mm. You know, um, so... Um, uh, when you when you read these passages, I mean he he is really saying that you're in a better position, you're in a better position praxis wise even uh, to be uh, not making uh, propositions, not coming up with programs, not giving alternatives, not providing solutions, right? Um, and so he's, he, he writes there, right, uh, this is uh, on the in English uh, version translation we have at page 293, you know, open thinking points beyond itself. It's about 10 lines into the final paragraph. Um, for its part, a comportment, a form of praxis, it is more akin to transformative praxis than a comportment that is compliant for the sake of praxis, right? And so, and, and what he develops in the next few sentences is this idea that somehow in the, in the confrontation uh, that is the negative dialectic, there is something that survives. In thought, in critical thought, there is something that survives that is itself the most valuable um, element present, the most, and so he ends, uh, on a, on a, actually, he ends on an uh, uplifting note, uh, suggesting that thought is happiness, even where it defines unhappiness, by enunciating it. By this alone, happiness reaches into the universal unhappiness. Whoever does not let it atrophy has not resigned. Now, so 
That's interesting because, of course, that's a notion of productivity that has to be distinguished from a notion of positivity, right? Um, but that makes me think that, and this is something, and, and I'll come back to this in part because later, uh, because you, wrote, you, you, you raised the question of Foucault's uh, parallelisms, and I think that's an important question that we should address, but, and, but I don't want to distract, and I'll come back to that later. Um, but with Foucault, too. Um, sometimes I read these interventions, particularly Adorno's interventions, as being a necessary corrective, right? But when one approaches it from that perspective, of course, it has a different character, almost. Uh, so in other words, the extreme negativity, I think, comes out in part because he's trying to make a corrective to where philosophy is at that moment, particularly in the late 60s. Um, now, what that, what that might suggest, of course, and I think this is probably true of all philosophical interventions, right, is that one need not always give them the extreme interpretation that they have, that they need in order to be that corrective. In other words, Sartre, with existentialism in the 40s and 50s, right? That too was a corrective. Now, that, what that might mean is that when he says, when he writes, when he writes in his existentialist writings, late 40s, that you know, um, uh, existence precedes essence. That again is also kind of an extreme position, but it's but it's because he's trying to confront a discourse and a space that he views as having shifted in the, in, in the wrong direction. If that's true, right, then yes, to be sure, we could think of this text and these interventions as being extreme negativity, but maybe it was less, or maybe we, we can read it today as less extreme in part because we can interpret it as something that was being uh, pushed a little bit further in order to correct a deviation uh, that was sensed. And, and, and that's where then some positivity could be found in this. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I do. And of course, this is in itself an Adornian topos, let's say, on hyperbole mm -hmm. and exaggeration. Mm -hmm. So when he says, for example, that everything in... So psychoanalysis is true as an exaggeration. Or when he says, all thinking is exaggerating. And the polemical nature of, or corrective, as you said, or no, po polemics is, I think, the also maybe a, the better word for that, definitely is there. I would shy away, however, to translate that into he meant something else which is less extreme and even the negativity might be productive. I would think that exactly that idea would fall prey to what he seems to attack, namely the idea that there should be consolation in thinking. But this depends on how strong you make the term productivity, let's say. And I, I, I can imagine, let's say, harmless or weaker senses of that. And then I would definitely agree. Mm. But, but there's definitely something productive here. Yeah, exactly. Here, right? But so the question is, it's not, it's not an alternative program. It's, right. not a, it's, not a, it's not a constructive criticism, which, he's, which is his target. Mm. His target is the idea, well, why don't you give me constructive criticism? Mm. Don't just give me criticism. Give me something constructive. Mm. I, can, I can, you know. That's his target. Um, but, but that gesture is not but empty. But so it's it not has empty, yeah. right? Because it, it, there's a remainder. Mm -hmm. There's something that survives, is what he says here. There's something that survives from the, from the critique, I take it, that actually puts us in a better position. Um, uh, and so, and, and, uh, which is why, of course, it's not 
nihilist, I mean, so the extreme negativity mm. is not mm. nihilist, which one might possibly, I mean, it depends how you define nihilism, but I mean, that would be a direction in which maybe if, if this were on a spectrum, it would be tending toward the, the, great, the more extreme mm. you go, the, more, the closer one might be to conceptually to something like nihilism. It's not. Um, and in part, it has to be because there's actually a belief that this is ultimately uh, more productive. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree completely. Except that I wouldn't use the word productive. Okay, so what's the um, what's the let's what's the let's word? look at the the very last passages, yeah. and you might read again if you can the sentence about happiness and thought is happiness because mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. don't have the, the English before me. Could okay, you sure. That? So this um, is the penultimate. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think so. Some of the passages is, there's but eleven, twelve lines up or something. Um, is whatever has once been thought can be suppressed, mm -hmm. uh, cannot, can, whatever has once been thought can be suppressed, forgotten, can vanish, but it cannot be denied that something of it survives. Yep. That seems very important. So this idea that um, uh, on, this, on this dialectic, right, that the, the, the theory, the thinking can be suppressed but something of it will always remain, mm. right? Something of it will always survive. Um, he writes, for thinking has the element of the universal. What once was thought cogently must be thought elsewhere by others. Um, uh, so, and then, and then he comes to the happiness. The happiness that dawns in the eye of the thinking person is the happiness of humanity. The universal tendency of oppression is opposed to thought as such. The universal tendency of oppression is opposed to thought as such. Mm -hmm. Thought is happiness, even where it defines unhappiness by enunciating it. By this alone, happiness reaches into the universal unhappiness. Whoever does not let it atrophy has not resigned, mm -hmm. right? So it's not resignation, mm -hmm. in fact, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not resignation because one continues to believe that thought, that critical thought somehow um, uh, survives and can survive. Which, as you were, actually, as you, st as you started your presentation um, and you were suggesting the idea that critical thought is necessary as a step before, as possibly as a step before, uh, you had suggested <coughs> as, as to, to kind of lay the groundwork to prepare a transition mm -hmm. uh, towards action. Um, I was also thinking, and it's also on Adorno's thought, it's also necessary as a step after. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the doubt about the praxis. In other words, this moment of uh, kind of critical reflection that he wants to hold on to, I think is not only kind of in preparation for understanding action properly and acting properly, whatever that would mean, but it's also to question actions constantly, to doubt one's own praxis after the action mm -hmm. and to doubt it in part. And, 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 and I mean, I think this was, uh, this was probably, I mean, well, I don't want to, I can't say what was going on at the time, but, but a fear, I mean, one interpretation would have been that it was a fear that the activities, the, the movements at the time were a form of group think uh, that, was, that had some um, elements of um, coercion in them uh, that were, might have been parallel to some of the forms of group think mm. from the middle of the century. Yeah. And he says so. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so, and so, and so the idea there is, is that thinking needs to doubt, needs to critique, needs to uh, put in question these forms of action, particularly to ensure that they don't devolve into 
kind of a coercive practice, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and and that's and I think that that's the that's the idea in this final paragraph that the thought that something survives. You can forget it. You can quash it. You could have a form of groupthink, but nevertheless, the thoughts, the critical thoughts, will survive, and then we'll be able to perhaps. Um, will be able to resist uh, uh, new deviations, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. No, no, I, I definitely agree. Again, the only hesitation or reservation I have is against calling that moment productive, let's say. OK. But, that's, but that might be a, okay. a matter of a choice of words only, exclusively, I could imagine. Because I, I, I read that in, the, in that way. It's not nihilistic because it is committed, namely committed to a pretty, pretty good thing, namely happiness, universal happiness right. even. But thinking is not bringing happiness about. It's not constructing, producing it or generating it, but it thinks it. And it thinks it while it calls the bad or the wrong a bad or a wrong. And there is something like a mediated connection to practice and even to the revolutionary <coughs> practice of bringing the human good for all about, but without realizing it. And therefore, there's this tension. It's something that is still up in the air. <coughs> so it has not settled already. It's not already a machine mm -hmm. that is in a way doing revolution or bringing <coughs> about mm -hmm. the good, but it's keeping it, it up in the air as a possibility. And therefore, thought <coughs> is happiness, even when it only calls out the wrong, which is something <coughs> that should also resonate with you as a human rights activist. Sometimes it's not a matter of bringing about justice, but <coughs> calling in justice and justice. And right. in a way, also sometimes retaining yeah. that pure moment of being right in calling it injustice, even when it's not so clear what the just action would be. And for me, Adorno is defending that very moment. Even if he thought the student movement is right in calling for the radical transformation of society, which is called revolution, it might, sense, it might make sense not to determine the <coughs> moment and the ways and the procedures and the strategies and the goals of the revolution, but just calling it out or thinking it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea that the intellectual at the end of his life is in a way modest enough to attribute to himself exactly that role, not in a way guiding anyone. So this is an anti-avant-gardist, anti-Leninist position, of course, because he seems to say the philosophers will not be helpful in bringing the revolution about. They might even make things more complicated, but they are on the right side because they are thinking the abolition of injustices and the human wrongs, but they're not contributing to the program of changing this society or devising the roads or, let's say, the mechanisms or mm -hmm. the techniques of happiness, mm -hmm. but they are thinking happiness. And this is one way of realizing it, but not mundanely, but in thought. And this is something I would also defend against the idea that even that idea has to be somehow immediately productive. Sorry if I misinterpret your usage of the term. Because I would think the idea that thinking has to be productive means now you have to cash out what this means. And he seems to say, no, I don't. I'm just in a way, evoking it, calling, mm. not the name of God, mm. but the name of the revolution or mm. the universal mm. abolition of injustice. Mm. And this is something that's also hesitant, zögerlich. Zaudernd, I would say. And this is an interesting gesture to end a book, by the way, because it's bold, but it's also modest at the same time. And by the way, historically, nobody was happy reading these lines. Everyone was in a way disappointed. The student movement was uh, disappointed because he was betraying the revolution by not engaging in it. But the bourgeois thinkers, the social democrats, let's say, were disappointed because he was not even contributing to social democratic or evolutionist reform. Because he seemed to say, no, I'm more radical in thought, but these means I'm not even radical in my 
politics, but in between. And that's an uneasy chair to sit on, mm -hmm. to say the least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want yeah. more. You want him no, to sit no, no, on no, a no, 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 no. I, I, um, I, I do think it's important somehow to distinguish different forms of positivity. Or, I mean, the, the reason I'm, I used the word productivity is because I don't want to use the word positivity because that was clearly not was it at stake. Um, but what I, but, but, and, and, and I'm not sure that it need, that the, that the, that the productivity needs to be defined more or articulated more because I don't think that it's part of the method to be productive. Um, the method is productive, but it's not, okay. it's not a quest to be productive, and it's not an effort to be productive, and it's certainly not an effort to increase the productivity of the method in any way. But it is a statement that Adorno, at least on my reading, believes that this does not lead you down a path where it, that this does not lead you down a path this negative dialectics or extreme negativity does not lead you down a path where you are ultimately disarmed or harmed that you are better off um, taking this path uh, which is which is the which is that aspect. And, 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 I, and I think he's comfortable leaving it at that, mm. saying, no, this isn't, this isn't resignation, mm. right? Au contraire. I'm, he, I mean, he's trying to suggest, like, I'm practically the only one, actually, who's not resigned, mm. exactly, yeah. right? Um, but, um, but that doesn't increase or, or decrease. Um, and it's not like, something that we can work on. I think it's, it's an inherent characteristic of this method, of this way of approaching problems that he's offering. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I yeah. see. Yeah. Again, yeah. this is only a stance I would not call yeah, so productive or word. geared towards um, productivity. Uh, I mean, somehow, it's related to non-nihilism somehow. Hmm. But it's also not functional to anything else. Whereas for me, the metaphor of productivity mm. in a way would evoke some kind of mm. functionality, instrumentality, mm. Mm. which he mm. doesn't seem to, to connote. No, well, it couldn't be instrumental, Yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and then it would be so uh, productivity without product, which might be a nice way of yeah. putting it. Um, okay, but I may, may, maybe the, the only point, though, is that um, on, this, on this question of, well, yeah, I mean, the way I, the way I was introducing it was the, the corrective uh, notion, um, which I think is, is, is important somehow. So it means that we're, we're and you're right, this is, in the thought of Adorno itself, it's in the negative dialectic itself. These these tensions and these the ways in which uh, confrontation can push in one direction or another. I mean, it, th this this wouldn't have had to be called negative dialectics if it wasn't for the fact that he was within a, dis a Hegelian resisting a Hegelian discourse, or resisting a Marxist discourse as well, right? So um, so that would lead me to think that um, on this precise question of where exactly, where exactly it is situated in terms of its negativity, right? In part, that question itself is a 
is, is a product of this being an intervention that needed to take apart uh, the piece of the dialectic, which we'll get to next, that somehow resolved positively or integrates the, it, or integrates it yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so should we take comments and questions concerning these two texts before we move on? Sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, what is There's a, a mic, yeah. yeah. It's better for the stream. Is my question, is it, is it um, yeah, yeah. working? My question is about the notion of possibility, also at the very end um, of this designation essay. I think it's com uh, a very um, important when he says here, um, the reproduction, the mental reproduction of what already is, as long as it does not interrupt itself, it holds on the possibility. And then um, he says um, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the very end um, of the introduction in the negative dialectics that, of course, the possibility cannot be in opposition to reality, and this is social reality, because this would be only an abstract possibility. But at the same time, it cannot be a possibility um, completely integrated um, or realized um, in our social reality because thinking is um, a transcendence um, of our social reality um, or our um, uh, social um, world. So, so it means that th there has to be a kind of possibility um, which is internal to thought itself because thought has a transcendence um, if it is about something universal, as he says in, in the very end. And this is why the thinker um, um, realizes um, happiness. So he tries to give, uh, give it an ethical twist in saying, if thinking is not about something um, 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 singular, but something universal, um, it realizes happiness. Um, and, and then um, um, the context if of is, of course, um, not um, only um, the <coughs> thinking of what thought is about, so in being a human, human being, um, 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 I'm able to think, um, and this is what the human being would, would be all about. It is in the context of social struggles, as he says before. But then uh, the thinking of, some, uh, of a possibility would mean we have to think what is missing um, in the social struggle. So what is not, what is not there? Um, um, this means who is not there in the social struggles and who is not able to speak or what we, what is, what we are not able to say. And this is where negativity com comes in, I think. So this would mean a possibility. Uh, the possibility means it's something not um, fully integrated in reality, but at the same time not opposed to the reality um, um, we live in right now. So it's something on the border. It's a transcendence, but the transcendence in the imminence of our social world, so to speak. And maybe this is... Um, um, in its very structure, what happiness could mean um, uh, in, in thinking as a philosophical encounter, of course, which is not completely um, um, so um, a, a subject, uh, um, so a subject, a, a, a subjective point of view. It's it's a collective uh, practice. Then, mm -hmm. so I, I was won wondering how how you would um, understand this this very crucial notion of possibility here in, uh, in the very end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I would, I, I had two quick thoughts and then one of them is um, possibility as the gap somehow or possibility as the gap or the remainder or the, um, the, the, the aspects of non-identity that are uh, that result from uh, conf the confrontation. Um, so I I hear that notion of possibility as precisely um, what um, 
uh, <laughs> here I am again talking of productivity, but what is productive in the, in the dialectical clash, um, it's almost as if one thinks of you know, the CERN collider, um, the, uh, the, the, the way in which kind of somehow as these uh, molecules clash, something is, is uh, something, some, there's some possibility Right, would be the word that I would think of. Uh, um, that's, that's uh, uh, I think that I would say is produced, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that, that comes from this in some way. Um, so that, that was one quick thought. And, but the other thought, um, which, I'm, which we can come back to later maybe, is the, you know, Daniele Lorenzini is developing a, a way of interpreting uh, the Foucauldian genealogy as a possibilizing uh, move uh, of, of kind of unearthing possibilities. Um, and so there too, uh, I think there's probably some, con some conversation we could have between Adorno's notion of possibility and Foucault's notion of possibilizing uh, genealogies. Two quick thoughts, but go ahead, um, uh, Martin. No, similar. Associations For me, there's a Weberian line in this and the debate about real possibilities mm. in historical sciences. Mm. And so already Weber was looking for a way to make sure that the historian talks about, or the sociologist for that matter, talks about not only what was there and what was happening, but also what could have happened. And there was the idea that there should be some methodological rules in a way, guaranteeing this. And Adorno was always trying to say that conformist sociology is only doubling the social facts that are already there. This was what he was calling positivism. Whereas a real sociology would also, in a way, evoke or disclose what the social could be. And this, I would agree, would be something like a social theory of the possible. And what he calls uh, open thinking, often this Denken here, seems to be exactly that, a thinking of the possible, even vis-a-vis -vis the things that are pretty closed and pretty factual and not possible. But <coughs> this is definitely a, um, a fundamental layer of this whole project. And by the way, if I may, to me it makes sense to say for that very reason this is an ontological sort of enterprise because Thinking the possible is not a matter of only thinking or epistemological issues, but it's also thinking, let's say, the ontological valence of the possible within, within the real. And this, in a way, would bring that kind of thinking pretty close to a couple of other paradigms, namely Deleuzeanism, for example, that in a way would play on the virtual here. And sometimes there might be convergences between these programmatics that seem unlikely, but might be founded in something like these very abstract notions. Sarah Bianchi. Yeah, thank you very much, Mario. Yes, it's recording. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the um, introduction and the discussion. And I would like to jump into the discussion um, on the question of the uh, adjective productive because um, I, I can absolutely understand all the hesitations and um, but w by thinking um, of Foucault and his understanding of productivity as constituting something um, I, I think uh, or I, I sympathize with the word because um, for me it's something like the catalyst or the motor um, of pushing um, developments f further and not just being stuck in wrong um, circles, like um, in, in the dialectics of enlightenment, for example. So it's like um, the question how the tension can um, be remained or kept vivid. So I would like to ask you how you would understand it. And if I may, may, uh, may, may already link to the introduction from the negative um, dialectics there, he has um, the, the so important um, phrase of sich selber rücksichtslos zu kritisieren. So this is for me something like the productive mm -hmm. formula. Oh, I would be 
Failing. That's in the introduction. Uh, yes, it's, it's in the first page. In the in the Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Which starts as the possibility of philosophy, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, uh, again, I, I have some thoughts about yeah, Foucault's, yeah. Foucault's relationship here, which seems appropriate because, mm -hmm. because it was precisely that notion of productivity, right, that was the turning point in his thought in 1972, right, as he exits Attica and he rethinks the whole project on the prison and says, you know, I've been, I've, I've only been thinking of the prison in its repressive form, right, but I, what I really need to understand is, you know, what it, what it does, right, and that's the notion of productivity there that leads to the development in the punitive society, but then ultimately leads to discipline and punish, which explores the productivity of these disciplinary uh, forms. Um, and of course, mostly the kind of the creation of docile bodies and such. Um, and of course, the same move is in History of Sexuality, Volume 1, which is to reject the repression hypothesis in order to understand. And, and, and you can think of practically all of his work from, um, from 72 on, really, as being about um, uh, how we, how we um, create ourselves as subjects or how we govern ourselves through these forms, right? And, and that is a notion of uh, productivity. Um, um, and uh, I, would, I, I, I would need to get the text right in front of me. I forget the exact word he uses, but you know, it's page 24, right? Where it's like, no, we have to, and, and, and so it would be interesting to figure it out, maybe I'll, no, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that would be a but, different seminar. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a different seminar. Now, but then the question is, how is that different <coughs> than here? Because I think there's something different going on here. I think that the notion that I was suggesting, which I'll hold on to for the time being, of um, why it is that one would want to engage in negative dialectics or why it is that one would want to hold on to thought, thought that survives, that is the only thing that is non-resignation, um, it, somehow it has a slightly different character. Um, because I don't think that it's suggesting yeah, I don't think that it's suggesting, and this is important, I don't think that it's suggesting something epistemological in the same way that, um, that Foucault is suggesting, uh, which means possibly that at the, at the end of the day, um, uh, there isn't the same constitutiveness in... Adorno of what this method is doing, I think. So it's very, epistemologically, it's very different, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, just, uh, yeah, a quick, a quick thought is that, I mean, at the end of the day, right, where Foucault leaves us is in a space where we need to understand our own ways in which power, uh, knowledge, power, have uh, uh, affected our own understandings of ourselves, of our milieu, of where we are today. And, and, and that, that is a space that ultimately is is bootstrapped again by the forms of knowledge power that surround us. Um, 
I'm not sure, that at the end of the day, with Adorno, and so, and here I'll turn it over to you, I don't think that the idea is that we would get to a space where the relationship to truth is such that it remains constructed by forms of knowledge power that we need to deconstruct. I think that there's a, a less mediated uh, relationship to truth for Adorno when you come out of this process or when you, whoever does not let it atrophy, as he mm. says, right? It's a, it's a less mediated, it's a closer proximity somehow to, to, to truth, I think. But mm. yeah. what do you think? So the, the whole topos of truth would be also a different seminar. And yeah. this would not be the best passages to approach it, I fear. And also the passages we selected from the negative dialectics don't really have a, a clear grip on that, having to do with, let's say, the dramaturgy of the whole book and uh, the status of the meditations on metaphysics. But that's, I think, a different issue. I think we can agree on there's probably a deep convergence in the philosophical stances the two radical critiques <coughs> of Foucault and Adorno have or embody. And there might be a different sense of the results or the telos of that activity or ne negativity or criticality. Mm -hmm. And I'm only resisting against the two functionalist or two teleological kind of language in the very term productivity. Mm -hmm. Even if I see, you can of course re reframe it or rephrase it. And I only wanted to insist on the fact that Adorno is pretty clear on the insistence or affirmation that the place the negative dialectician or the philosopher inhabits is almost in it uninhabitable. It's not a stable place, but it's a processual place of unrest, a threshold, let's say. Mm -hmm. And it might be that the Foucauldian language sometimes is trying to demarcate something more stable. But that's mm -hmm. also, I think, mm -hmm. almost for another occasion to mm -hmm. settle. Yeah. So Frieda Vogelmann is, I think, last for that round, because I would like to turn to those passages in the negative dialectics that, to me, seem to resonate with these more extreme or ultra-negativistic side, even if we take it apart in the discussion again afterwards. OK, thanks a lot. Let me just uh, uh, voice a certain concern about your apologetic reading of this uh, resignation text, both of you, because I think there is something that has to be said as well, as we are in a dialectic space after all, and that is, it is, to, to me, it brings out the best and the worst in Adorno, really, because it is almost indistinguishable from the ideology of the philosopher in his ivory tower, as well as the uh, philosopher who, with all the good arguments that you presented, has the right to remain in his negative dialectics. But there is the other side as well, and you cannot pass over that reading this text. So for, let me just um, make more explicit two aspects of that. So for the one instance is that this is not in continuity with the actuality of philosophy. There, the goal was to destroy that which gave rise to the need to form the constellation, right? There was a problem that this constellation of concepts was meant to destroy. And that, that is his, one of the most powerful passages in this uh, text, the actuality of philosophy. Nothing of that survives here. So you have to at least comment on, on that, because I, I think there is not resignation in here, but there is a dangerous uh, uh, closeness to, to, to the ivory tower ideology. And in this, yes, to quietism. And in this respect, actually, the right parallel would not be Foucault, but Althusser, mm -hmm. who says, no, we philosophers are right in doing what we are doing. So I think y you can't pass, pass over this uh, 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 challenge that Adorno lays down here um, in reading this text. So I'm, I'm just curious how, y how you would answer that, because I think you need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know how I would answer that. <laughs> <laughs> and you should. So, um, so your reading is more 
productive, let's say, yeah, than no. mine. <laughs> so I'll start, and then you. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but but we have to flip the order a lot more too. Um, it is that uh, it, it's that it's that precisely what I was trying to suggest is there's a sensibility that rubs me the wrong way, even if theoretically um, I might even say I agree, um, and that and that's the difference. And that's the difference. In other words, um, when when he writes, for instance, on page two ninety. Uh, about Marx, uh, that he had, may have presented the 11th thesis on Feuerbach so authoritatively because he knew he wasn't entirely sure about it. It's like, come on. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? I mean, really? I mean, you know, if there's one thing I wanted to hold on to, right, it was the 11th thesis, right? I mean, and, you know, and, uh, and so it's just like, there's another way to say this. There's got to be another way to say this. There's got to be another way to say this. And, and in part, that, that's, the, that's where I situate myself, both in thinking that, well, something is entirely right about um, the instability that we, we find ourselves in, the, the, the need to confront, uh, uh, the way in which it creates possibilities, um, the problematic nature of suggesting that there is a resolution um, and, the, and the benefit of being stuck in, in, the, in the complexity of the present, all of which I'm, I'm, I, 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 I am, I am, right? Um, without then saying, okay, but, I, but without then somehow making light of this desire for praxis and action, right? So that, that's how I uh, that's how I read this. Um, but you have a different view, or is it a a, a less? Um, no, I think I'm I'm agreeing with Frida that this is there. So there is something like a defense. I wouldn't say of the ivory tower, because in the ivory tower, the universal unrecht or injustice is not thought. The ivory tower thinkers are not leftists, but they think they are beyond left and right. Whereas he seems to think there is a place for the leftist philosopher, and you're right with the comparison to Althusser, which is something like abstractable from the real struggles. And if you put it like that, it sounds like quietism. I would say it had a different, but that's more a historical thesis than a systematic one. I think it had a different function because it wanted to say even the people who are politically right or on the right side are too tempted by what you call the groupthink of leftist and social and political movements and by a, a turmoil of getting into practice immediately. And he wanted to resist that, also for political reasons, because, so, yeah. But the question is, is that the right gesture today? Yeah, if okay, if okay, if we yeah, okay. If we're reading these texts today, mm -hmm. yep. I think, you, yep. especially in critical theory, that, mm -hmm. that is not something to pass yep. over lightly. Yep. So mm -hmm. is that something that we should take up today? Are we seeing too much action and <coughs> too, not enough thought. Is that really our predicament? I'm very doubtful okay. of that. Okay, but that's another question. No, but so that's the same question. No, it's, it's the, the question <laughs> we then raised. Um, we were so far only in a way trying to reconstruct a, also a, a historical place for that kind of answer. And, and I would say the productivity, I would say the sense of insisting on this unrestful, let's say dynamic, but also <coughs> hesitant resistance um, also against immediate practice or pseudo practice as he calls it. And you are right. So the next question would be whether this is so much dependent on a certain also socio-historical situation that it might be gone that moment. And it might be that thinking the present would 
in a way require something else. Mm -hmm. So let's go on to the second phase because <coughs> in it's there already in the preface and the introduction of the negative dialectics, but it's ultra present in these passages, uncanny passages on after Auschwitz from the meditations on metaphysics from the negative dialectics, the third part, mm -hmm. where he seems to say, everything I say is indexed historically. There's no way of thinking otherwise today, and this today, or this presentness, this historical moment, has a clear name, and it's called after Auschwitz, which means everything is different after or with this event having passed. And thinking and philosophy today will have to take on responsibility for this very historical and also moral moment it includes. And therefore, Frieda is right. So taking up the legacy of critical theory in this sense also means providing a right or an adequate diagnosis of a present moment and meaning what the present moment requires us to think. Just speaking about Adorno in 1966, he says, philosophy cannot engage in reconciliation, integration, or all kind of pseudo-religious, pseudo-theological projects of, in a way, making sense of the world. But thinking after Auschwitz making means making no sense or making unsense of the world. And every attempt to think otherwise, thinking through reconciliation or integration, is something like sinning against the historical truth of this very moment, which is called after Auschwitz, which means the very values and the very ca categories into which, through which uh, bourgeois and, let's say, traditional thinking was thinking, are utterly devalued. And this is an interesting ultra-historicism claiming that one could not think otherwise at that very moment because it would mean, in a way, sinning against the exigencies of the time. But it also means that classical philosophy that was constructive, productive, reconciliatory, making sensey, is completely devalued but not for systematic reasons, also for systematic reasons. So the failure of idealism is the formula for that. But it's devalued by history itself. And this is, let's say, the most Benjaminian moment maybe in the late work of Adorno, where he seems to say this one moment in history is one that is characterized by exactly that kind of, and now that's again my phraseology, extreme negativity or negative extremity, and not allowing that to enter thought would be not to think, or to only think constructively, reconciliatorily, or productively. And this would be a sin, sorry for the religious language, a sin against thinking itself. And now we would like to ask, what does that mean? So what does thinking think if it cannot think in terms of integration or synthesis or reconciliation, and he doesn't seem to offer too much, except it means taking seriously the historicity of the situation of the thinker itself. So that's the diagnostic part. Again, in parenthesis, an ultra Foucauldian kind of topos, so that thinking means thinking the present or thinking in the present and of the present. The second is thinking the moral dimension of the present, which leads him to formulate that <coughs> pretty unlikely new categorical imperative in the second, second uh, paragraph mm -hmm. of this part, where he seems to say thinking after Auschwitz means thinking and acting in a way that Auschwitz cannot happen again. And the third, of course, would be, and this is the more methodological part, that it means integrating the critique of totality, the critique of synthesis and reconciliation into systematic thinking itself. And it's, again, the same topos that we already know from the other texts, that there is a space for thinking that, as he also says, thinks against itself, that tries to think against its own tendency to produce or to construct synthesis, reconciliation, 
and meaning. And again, a little bit like in my first remarks, I would like to insist on and defend at least the philosophical gesture of saying that there is a space for thinking that is not stable, not foundational, and not fixed, but that in a way essentially consists in radical self-critique and self-undermining. And that there could be a form of philosophy that will never rest when it does not do that. And therefore it will be inherently negative and it will be inherently thinking against synthesis or integration and against the kind of consolations and reconciliations traditional, let's say, bourgeois philosophy was offering. I take Frieda's point that it would be wrong to think that this is a systematic thesis on thinking of philosophy as such. It cannot be, because the first element in these three things I was just trying to in a way, keep apart, even if they belong together, the first idea was every thinking is thinking in its time and in its historical context and in a certain legacy. Therefore, it cannot be that we today have to inhabit the same, let's say, figure of thought. We are not thinking after Auschwitz. We are thinking, let's say, after, after Auschwitz. Because our society is not the one that, in a way, that was denying also the historical guilt of the Third Reich. It's we are in a, in a different phase, namely a society that has already integrated, in a way, that guilt and responsibility into a certain social self-understanding, and now we probably have to attack maybe sometimes the too easy, however you want to call that, too easy forms of Vergangenheitsbewältigung and integration of that kind of negativity into one's own self-understanding. Therefore Adorno seems to urge us to ask us what is pressing and, in the Foucauldian phrase, dangerous today, and it cannot be the same thing because this is a text that's 53 years old. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you have to think vis-a-vis -vis and against your own time, in your time and against your time at the same time, so to say, seems to be the methodological imperative that also means that the very forms of synthesis and reconciliation offered at a given time are the things you have to attack. And they will be different. And it could be that it's not traditional philosophy and the consolations of religion or theology, that are challenging us, but it might be other things, maybe scientism, maybe positivism in a new, let's say, neurological or capitalist form of way. But I would like to take away again from that text the urge of not thinking of philosophy, and sorry again, as a productive practice or enterprise, but exactly again as a practice of thinkingly undoing productivities, consolations, reconciliations. Mm -hmm. And even that, of course, would have some resonances with other forms of, let's say, anti-foundationalist or anti-fundamentalist philosophies. But there might be a specific profile of this. And it could be that the insistence on the context specificity and the historical specificity of thinking itself might be the best part or the best point of starting to discuss this very idea because there is something uncanny about the insistence that in 1966 you cannot not think Auschwitz or after Auschwitz as if this 20, 25 years had not changed anything. But it seems to think that history itself places a certain responsibility and a certain burden on thinking even 20 years, that means a generation and a half later. And this is something I find fascinating, but I would also like to call dangerous or hazardous, because it's not a place on which you can stand easily, because it's also, again, thinking against your own fundaments and against the own against the own soil on which you stand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So far for this part. Yeah. So um, 
Yeah, so I, I have a lot of thoughts, and then let me try and organize them somewhat. Um, I think there's no doubt that the instability, the, 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 the fundamental instability of negative dialectics uh, presents a challenge to this passage about the categorical imperative. And then the question is, how do you, how do you resolve that challenge in a way? It, obviously, it presents a challenge because if anything, the categorical imperative is the, is the opposite of the unstable of, 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 you know, of, of the rethinking. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the radical opposite of that, right? So um, the part of it is going to have to do with the question of the historicity of, of, uh, of our positioning and, and, and entirely right that the whole uh, purpose, maybe I will say productivity of this conversation is to actually ask the question of whether or not uh, critical theory today is uh, needs to be pushed in a particular direction or not. And, 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 and when I was arguing last year and still believe in Praxis 1313 about the primacy of Praxis as opposed to, right, which, is, which was rejected, right? It was a corrective. It is a corrective. And so um, I agree entirely that, that in terms of how this kind of shakes out today, it's that somehow the, the corrective needs to, to, to push in a different direction right now. What's interesting is that it's almost as if Adorno had identified this, uh, it, particularly in the, in the critique. There's this passage in the critique um, discussion where uh, it's on page 284 of the English translation, so it's about smack middle in the, of the essay, where he identifies critical thought as becoming departmentalized. Uh, and he has this sentence where he says, critique is being departmentalized, as it were. It is being transformed from the human right and human duty of every citizen into a privilege of those who are qualified by virtue of the recognized and protected positions they occupy. And he was talking about the fact that he had a privileged position and that he was able to continue to engage in critique because of the because of the deference given to professors in Germany at this period, still. Um, but there was, a, there was already, a, but it's interesting that there was already a notion there, which I think has only been accentuated since 1969, that critical thought has been uh, departmentalized, has been contained, and has been kind of um, uh, limited to uh, certain, uh, certain academic fields predominantly um, uh, and at the margins of certain academic fields. Uh, and at, in marginal academic fields, especially. Um, so, so it's interesting that he was cognizant of that um, himself, because I think that's even more true of the present, present, which then means that we do need to recalibrate in some way, I would think. So the historicity becomes key here, and, and in that I think you're entirely right. Um, what, would it, what does it mean to say um, that we have to arrange our thoughts and actions so that Auschwitz will not repeat itself, so that nothing similar will happen? Now, and it has to also mean uh, that we uh, have to arrange our thoughts and actions so that slavery uh, will never repeat itself. Um, it has to also mean that we have to, uh, in the United States, arrange our thoughts and actions so that Jim Crow will never repeat itself, or that mass incarceration will never repeat itself. Um, uh, I, there's a way in which, I think, Auschwitz is, uh, in a way, uh, standing in and after Auschwitz is both after Auschwitz and Auschwitz are standing in for uh, 
forms of gross in, injustice that have to be able to be thought in terms of other historical contexts as well. Um, and um, have to be thought in this way that, uh, so uh, Fred Moten and Stefano Har uh, Harney in their book, uh, The Undercommons, has this discussion of, of uh, thinking about abolition, in the context of abolition, of slavery, abolition of injustice, abolition of, uh, of, uh, of, our, of our racial inequalities in the United States, thinking broadly about abolition of the prison, et cetera, not only of abolishing these practices, but abolishing the societies that produce these practices. Now, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I suspect that that could be sympathetic with the analysis here although it's not explicitly on the page in the same way, right? Um, it's not saying we have to arrange our thoughts and actions so that we, in a sense, abolish the society that, or the, abolish the, the relations or the social relations that made Auschwitz possible. Um, it is more kind of in the moment it is more about not having the historical phenomenon rather than dealing with the societies or the social relations that make it possible to have that phenomenon uh, of injustice. And um, what we would need to think about in the present in thinking through this is, and it would be different, I'm sure it would be different in, in Germany, and uh, sp geography and, and spatial issues are key here uh, and can't be um, avoided. It's coming from the United States, um, I, would be, I would be thinking uh, in these times particularly specifically about the avoiding the societies, the society that made possible something like racialized mass incarceration in the United States. Um, but I'm not sure that, um, but I'm not sure, so, so there is a categorical imperative here which is feels uncomfortably stable. And but, uncomfortably specific. And uncomfortably specific. Maybe too specific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although, I don't know, is it possible that, uh, that, there is a, that there is a stable point of moral judgment that remains fixed as we engage in forms of negative dialectics to th analyze society? or something like that. I mean, that would be the question, I think, yeah. that comes out from this passage um, in terms of its historical setting. Mm. Uh, These are complicated, of course, and serious, ultra-serious issues. And to do justice to them also in, within the context of Alonso's other oeuvre, of course, would also mean talking about what it means to use a proper name and what the proper name is. Is the proper name a stand-in for something else or an exemplar or is it singular in a specific sense? And this is also a topos enormously important in the rest of the book. And then the questions come up, does Adorno at that time think that there are similar things like Auschwitz? He does, so he names Vietnam, for example. He names Hiroshima sometimes. and. He seems to think there are likenesses, resemblances of other kind of injustices to that, even if this remains singular and therefore representative of something that is more extreme than other things. And that's also on the, let's say, exegetical level, extremely hard to, to point 
down. But I think the, let's say, formal or methodological point is pretty straightforward. History forces you to think a certain thing, a certain event, a certain thought at a certain time. And it forces you to think its opposite, namely the categorical imperative not to let that happen again. And whatever is there in this specific proper name, it comes from history itself, not from thought. So this is a radically anti-idealist gesture. So what freedom would be, or what the moral thing to do would mean, is not up for grabs. It's not up to decide to the theorist, or the transcendental ego, or what have you, absolute spirit. It comes from the other of thinking, namely from history itself. And the crimes associated with the name of Auschwitz are in a way material, they are factual. And not even thinking can unthink the factuality of that. And therefore, thinking has to accept something like a legacy or a responsibility or a guilt and has to react to that. So that for me is a very deep and interesting philosophical conception that seems hard to reconcile with the more dialectic Hegelian idealist leanings of the text that are there too. The idea that, almost in a Levinasian sense in a way, so the other of history and of guilt and of the, uh, the injustice comes over the one who thinks about it. It's nothing that he could change or alter, but something he has to accept also as a, as a forderung. So this is something I see, and it's also connected to what Adorno in general thinks about morality, that it's not something you construct or think about, but something that has to be thought in a certain way. So that's his Kantian moment, at least in moral philosophy. But that, again, and that makes it also ultra-complicated, is only connected to history negatively. Not that, again, is the only, let's say, content of this categorical imperative, which is a strange thing, because we would think a categorical imperative should at least give you something to do and not something not to do, whereas the content of that imperative is purely negative, and in that it also is kind of limitless, because what would it mean not to let that happen again? How many things do you have to do to not that let it happen again? And th all these kind of things are pretty, I think, hard to get your head around. So again, we have something like an operation of, let's say, extreme, negativity that comes from something that is not thinking or spirit or thought itself. And therefore, philosophy has to remain in contact with, in a feeling, touching contact with its other, that is determining it in some way. But it's also there's also, in a way, a space for philosophy to actively take on the responsibility to think that very thing of the present and to think these very things you should not let happen again. And I would again insist on the fact that this is methodologically ultra-negativist because it lets itself determine, but only in a negative way. It makes you take on a historical responsibility but does not give you a project, a vision of a good society, it only gives you a vision of the society that is not catastrophic, namely one that does not go to that extreme which was the ultimate crime. And that's, again, Frieda is right. We should think about what is our Auschwitz today, if you allow that bad pun, which means thinking what is the condition of the present and its extremes. And Adorno is probably, again, not giving us anything. Mm -hmm. So this is the task of thinking to determine its own historical place and time, and also determining its own exigency, its own forderung, mm -hmm. and its own being determined by its other in historical specificity. And again, a philosophy that does that, or urges us to think in that way, is not, sorry, productive. Mm. It's not constructive. It's not mm. conciliatory. It's not in 
integrative, mm. but yeah. something else. Mm. And again, I would call that an unstable, maybe slightly impossible kind of practice. But this is what Adorno seems to think what thinking or philosophy or theory in the form of negative dialectics is. Mm. And probably not even the name negativism that is quite fashionable in philosophy today is a good name for it because the negativism term seems to connote that there is a productive side to that negativity, whereas his whole point seems to be, at least in these darkest passages of the book, that there is no point mm. and nothing to be learned mm. except that this one thing should not happen again and this is not something you learn, this is something you have to do. Um, so, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is that you're so uh, it's 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 fascinating the way you bring up the negativity of that categorical imperative. Um, I'm wondering though if negative, if it's negative in the same way as negative dialectics. Um, so I'm wondering if. I mean, it is, it is surely negative in the sense that you're right, that it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a categorical imperative that, ro that works through, like, not negative. doing, yeah, you know? But I'm wondering if, um, if, there, if, if, it's, if it's different than what goes on in the confrontation of negative dialectics, because, because, it, does have a, because it does have a certain fixity to it. Um, that I feel is less uh, that is not that is not that there isn't uh, in the negativity of negative dialectics now and um, it does feel though as if one of the real uh, problems on the table right now is this question of productivity. Um, at least that's, the, so that's the way that, that's, you know, that, that's the way our conversation has uh, evolved in relation to these, to this text. And um, for some reason, as we were talking about this, I was thinking about the passage in The Actuality of Philosophy where he talks about these keys, right? these keys that open, un, that open doors, and the key has to be the right size, and it can't be too big, and it can't be too small, and the, and the keys are these concepts, I take it, I mean the ones, the keys that he uses as examples in the actuality of philosophy are uh, class, the concept of class, is one key that seems to open a lot, the other is commodity. Mm -hmm the commodity form that opens up. So, of course, so, you know, two classic Marxist concepts that he argues are middle level enough to open something up. And you had used the word constellation earlier, although I felt that um, you were using it again in a, in a, in a, in a more extreme negative, negativity than I would give to it because it seems to me that these keys evolve into, I think, constellations that ultimately are helpful in unpacking something like questions of free will uh, in the negative dialectics. Um, so the, or the, the debate between free will and determinism, um, which he argues is, um, is um, I was going to say productive again, instinctively, but that, there's, that there's, there's work that is done through the n negative dialectic confrontation of a free will and determinism that actually um, can help us Understand the way in each, the way in each, in which each one is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, such that if you actually do believe in determinism, then mm. you're going to 
end up being quiescent or something. He has that passage, it's, you know, uh, around 280, uh, 285 or 286 or something like that, where he's discussing that. And each one, it says, and so um, it is through that method that, uh, that he wants to move forward in some way. Um, and it's through the method, I think, of constellations, which he discusses in that you know, section on constellations, that he methodically uh, wants to move forward, which suggests to me that, um, that, even, that even though this is framed again in negative terms, and even though there is the extreme negativity of negative dialectics, that um, that it remains the right path. Um, and, and, and so, um, yeah. Um. Huh? No, no, I, I see. And I could also imagine a reading of the whole book that would stress exactly that path, path like quality of negative dialectics, its methodological side, so to say, that also would insist on the fact that Adorno definitely is devising something like a whole way of philosophizing centered on the notion of constellations, of course, that in a way would allow for something like a different kind of thinking. And it could be that the aesthetics theory, unfinished in 1970, in a way would have been the complement to this kind of part of the negative dialectics. And this is perfectly sound and, I think, possible. Mm -hmm. By choosing the beginning of the Meditations of Metaphysics from that book, I would insist on the other, let's say, moment of the book, where he seems to say, after Auschwitz, the very idea of key, the very idea of path, is burnt and is gone and is rotten, as he said, Müll. Mm. And I would like to also retain that element, while not denying that the others are also there, and the idea that there could be a post-idealist philosophy that looks like idealism, but it is, in a way, its negativist complement. These passages are all there, mm -hmm. and the relation to Hegel is so complex that this is probably also one phase of this relationship. Mm -hmm. But for me, these passages, these 12 or 15 pages, insist on something more serious, a more somber. This Dark. is the, the, the Beckettone in the whole book, that this is something you do while you think and say and know that you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. And this has an under, in a way, self-undermining quality that he seems to think would be the nature or the essence of thinking itself. And thinking that would be something else, like a constructive, productive, architectonic, would also be a sellout of mm. thinking itself. Mm. And I would like to retain, let's say, that moment without saying that this is the only one and that this is the last word or this is the only thing that is there to think, but I would insist on the fact that this seems to be, let's say, the core philosophical experience the book is building on and is articulating. Mm. And this is something that's hard to swallow for philosophers who want to do, go on philosophizing. Mm. This is hard to swallow for critical theorists who want to have a theory that is explicating their very practice or mm. methodology. Mm. And maybe it's even hard to swallow for anyone who wants to know from critical theory what to do, Friede. But mm. it seems like a stance. Mm. And this is probably something we should try to think or understand or even follow. But now it's, of course, your turn. Yeah. Please. Yeah, so we're going to open it up. It, let me just say one thing, though. <laughs> because it's, 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 I find myself in an odd position of rehabilitating a certain, there's a certain aspect of Adorno here, which I, I wasn't expecting to find myself in that position. Mm. But it almost feels to me as if, if, if we, if, we, um, if we extend that moment, that dark moment, 
that I think you rightly find in the text, and one rightly finds actually throughout Adorno's work. If one, if one extends that moment, or if one is in it too long, it feels to me, then I think the answer becomes praxis for praxis' sake, basically. I mean, you know, that's where, that's where it pushes me, in a way. Um, because at that point, it's there, at that point, you know, why not? You know, because, you know, right? I mean, it's like, well, there's nothing else. So, so yes, so take to the streets and, you know, right? Um, and, uh, and that kind of almost severs, it almost sever, and it's an interesting way, of course. It, it would, it would, right? Because it would, it would not be sufficiently dialectical, maybe, right? <laughs> I don't know. That's just where I'm thinking. Yeah. But. Yeah. So let me just add it. I think I'm the last person to demand of critical theory to uh, actually lay out the plans for the new society. Um, but I think we can use one aspect of this dark moment that Martin mentioned and that you rightfully said is problematic if prolonged too much. And that is for me the moment in which it is historicist and materialist and a safeguard against the return of idealism in critical theory that we actually are witnessing, I would argue. Right? The return to Hegel and to Kant instead of Marx and Engels, for example, which is very prominent here, is just one instance of this return to idealism. And I think reminding ourselves that thought, if it wants to take up the challenge of critical theory in its, let's say, earlier phase, needs to be aware of that it is determined by not thought and to come to terms with that, which cannot mean neglecting or, 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 or defining that away. So I think that would be a, okay, now I said it, productive way of engaging with this moment. And it, it's not the only way, and it's not the last word of that, but it is one aspect that we can actually take up from it. Yes, about this question of Auschwitz and the singularity of this event, of this matter of fact, uh, Martin Zahr well said that there, there are some other examples that Adorno takes for Auschwitz, so Vietnam, uh, torture uh, as such. And so um, we can understand in this way that for Adorno it's, it's not the only matter of fact of Auschwitz or the, the rupture uh, be, um, um, after Auschwitz, but also the structural conditions that made Auschwitz possible. And these structural conditions are into our own categories, our own logics, our own concepts. So all the reflection on, uh, of Adorno on non unconceptual, non-conceptual, on um, non-identity, all these critiques of the uh, dif different forms of identity, thought, are maybe what we can take as a not something positive about the the proper work of, of critiques, of, of the proper work of negative dialectics. And it's not only something negative in in the in the signification of yes, all, all, the, all you develop, you just developed here, but um, yes, yeah, something related with the capacity of language uh, to criticize itself and to, to reflect upon itself. And that's maybe why also the constellation, it said, I don't know, say that the, the language, the model of uh, constellative denken or um, thinking or um, of constellation. So we could say more about the, the proper texture or the, the, the proper uh, way of expressing of critic itself. I think it's important uh, related to categories to the necessity of criticizing our own categories. How also, when Adorno says that we can do without our own categories, we can do without the, the category of identity, but we, may, we have to think against it uh, in each case. 
so. Yes, I can only underline what you said, that giving a full picture of that kind of philosophical program or operation would also involve reconstructing the philosophy of language and of mind that is embedded in it, and which is the critique of identity thinking and what it means to criticize categories of identity while not having others. And this also is a certain kind of reflexivity that is inbuilt into this critical program that is also, I would say, pretty radical and also not really redeemed, I think, by many current or contemporary theories. And this would be difficult. And the other thing that you said, uh, your first point is also, I think, crucial. Behind the formulation of the, the new categorical imperative stands, of course, a, a social theoretical vision of what structural conditions of these kinds of events are. And this is also something that Adorno thought would also be approachable via, let's say, Schaufel theoretical, sozialforscherische methods. And this is something that also, I think, would complement this moral stance. It's not just erecting this new categorical imperative, but it means understanding what led to the kind of things we should not let happen again. And this is a an enlightened, an enlightenment kind of program, and his pedagogical writings, in a way, were trying to also erect that kind of urgency to also for political education and and schooling. Let's say no, it's true. Yeah, Herr Schmidt, Dominic. Um, yeah. I, I want to ask for, 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 for one issue which kind of also also connects the the texts on, on resignation and, and critique and the, and the beginning of the introduction of the negative dialectics. Um, namely, yeah, le le let's begin with, with Adorno's reading of the of the thesis on on uh, um, on, on Feuerbach and. Um, it's like I, I always thought when I, when I read Adorno on the thesis on Feuerbach, uh, also like in, in this Magen, uh, Magen notes on theory and praxis, that it's he deals with theory and praxis as if this would be just like any pair of of dialectical uh, opposites. It's like uh, yeah, sometimes theory is is the main uh, uh, field of of um, of struggle. Sometimes it's prax praxis. It's Come see, come and um, and um, and this, this seem kind of seems to completely neglect that that this this um, th this relation of theory and praxis is also precisely what uh, is at stake in, in Adorno's very own uh, dialectical uh, method. And it's like uh, in the beginning of the negative di dialectics on the first page, he says something like. Uh, own, we have to, to properly silly separate theory and praxis. And on the second page, uh, he seems to be co completely um, 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 conforming to, to, to a primacy of, um, of practice. But, but he puts it in other words, in a, in a primacy of, um, of acknowledging the historicity of, of, of one's uh, th thought of thinking, and it's like th it's like the same phenomenon on the end of of resignation, where he also says, "Yeah, um, offenes Denken weist über sich hinaus. Seinerseits ein Verhalten, eine Gestalt von von Praxis, ist es der ver, uh, verändernden Verwandter als eines, das um der Praxis willen pariert." So there he he even seems to um, he even seems to admit that there is a primacy of this. Um, Es kommt darauf an, sie zu, um, um, sie zu verändern. And yeah, yeah, kind of my, my, my question would be how, how you would, how you would, um, <coughs> what, what your take would be on, on, on this, this issue and mm, um, it's, 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 it's also like I, I, I could never read, read uh, uh, the eleventh thesis on Feuerbach like, like Adorno because for me there's always also the fourth thesis on Feuerbach, which, which is this one uh, you have to, that there is this split between the, the realm on, in the heaven and the realm of the earth has to be explained out of the inner uh, uh, zerrissenheit of, of, of the earthly, earthly world. And it's, 
it's all about admitting the very uh, practical character of of um, of thinking itself and kind of my mm, and I mean for me there would be only two there would be kind of two um, two explanations one it's kind of a polemical uh, thing Adorno has to um, has to oppose a certain uh, unity of theory and practice even if it's his very own aim and the second one would be for me that he is not um, this is a bit vulgar maybe but that he has no uh, concrete analysis of uh, what precisely happened to with uh, with communism in the, in the Soviet Union because uh, <laughs> so so it's it's vulgar historical but um, I, th I think it's 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 precisely there that that they saw uh, no there can't be an immediate unity of theory and and practice they were they were basically saying the the very very same thing S and all Adorno has to to say on this is yeah they are authoritarian etc which is true but rather but it seems still seems to be something which he himself can't uh, can't admit as uh, as being um, mm, as being mm, um, affiliated with his very own own project. Um, so, would you definitely talk us next? Does this fit a little bit? Um, I can try. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it working or yeah? Okay. Um, um, so my question is circulating around um, when when Adorno says in resignation when he says that um, the thought somehow survives, always survives, and that is. Uh, maybe eternal and then I have to think of the political action as being ephemeral in the sense that it fulfills itself in the political goal that it somehow puts in front of its actions and um, I was thinking if uh, or I was asking myself what it says about critical theory that Adorno even answers the question of um, what theory has to do with political practice or um, what does it uh, what does it say about this open wound of critical theory that he um, puts a complete or puts several pages and texts and answers s uh, just on that question and somehow um, turns around points he which maybe years um, earlier have said differently. So um, when we talk about critical theory as the ivory tower or as somehow <laughs> related to this ivory th tower theory was pointed out. Um, I'm just asking, um, is it really, um, or isn't he just uh, opening this tower right in the moment where he imposes himself to answering that question? Because he wouldn't have to answer it. And critical theory itself gives already answers to this question. So the way his thinking is constituted already gives an answer. And him imposing himself to the act of answering does open this wound again. And I'm asking myself, um, if this isn't itself a political action to answer that question. So this was just maybe a bit related, <laughs> but not <laughs> very much. Would you be next? Mm -hmm. This is not something completely different. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I've got a clarificatory question because um, you brought up often the actuality of philosophy and I was puzzled that you mentioned or that some of us here mentioned that there's a huge break from the early Adorno to the late Adorno. Obviously there's a utterly different um, historic time but when I read the actuality of philosophy I thought that there are already some uh, some spurs or glimpses that shows in the direction of the later negative dialectics um, when, when he um, absolutely rejects the totalizing questions and points to the gestures of problematizing and so I thought these are um, hints or not hints but he retakes these uh, sketches just on clarification, mm -hmm. just on that point. No, I, th I was I was suggesting continuity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and um, and 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 I and I th and I think that there's enough there's enough continuity to suggest that these are that this is a development, as Buckmore suggests. I, I think that's right, an evolution um, with a more focused attention, though, on the on the particular character of the negative. Dialectic. Um, I mean, the, the 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 dialectic was present in thirty one, 
but it becomes, in a sense, the negative dialectic in, in 66, I think. Yeah. Um, but that was just for clarification on that point. Um, uh, maybe we should have some final thoughts, uh, Martin. Um, uh, would you like to go first? Um, or should I give you the last uh, word? What would you prefer? No, let, let, let me also just for a quick moment return to the, the Feuerbach thesis okay. idea. And I think uh, schmidt Domine is right. There is something something banal in Adorno's reading that seems to also be polemically directed against other vulgar or banal readings. And it could be that this is not doing justice to anything and of course not doing justice to Marx. But it, it seems like in this point he would be just practical yeah. <laughs> and not yeah. theoretical. But I like the formulation of the, the theory opening its own wound that you used. And that's, there is something to this. And maybe this is also just a way of trying to rephrase our dissensus on productivity of theory. Because I would, uh, Frau Tokas, exactly as you said, this is a theory that lays bare, lays open, that it tries to contribute to progressive emancipatory practice and cannot, or can only do so partially, because it's only theory. And tonight, I was stressing the modesty, the self-reflexivity, and the fri fragility of that gesture. And for me, the late Adorno is, and I agree with Frieda here, differently than his former self, so skeptical, so broken, also in his historical outlook, that this is one of his last words, that critical theory is always posing the question of the connection between theory and practice, and the question of the possibility of emancipation, or a different future, or of even redemption, but always already saying, and we cannot provide anything substantial here. And this, of course, is one variant of the whole idea of the ban on images, the builder for board, that critical theory tries to think paradise or redemption, and at the same time says we cannot. But thinking the cannot is also thinking it, but thinking it as an impossibility. And for me, these texts very much speak, in a way, in that tone, <coughs> or in that tonality and in the realm of politics but this is something very torturous and even violent and opening the wound I think is a good metaphor it's a theory that says we try to contribute to the emancipation of the suppressed masses but all we can offer is just another theory but <coughs> in a way holding on to this thought that this is a wound and not just a solution or an excuse is, I think, an ethical gesture that is in itself of a certain dignity, let's say. And I would like to characterize negative dialectics also as this gesture, not just as another philosophical program, in a way answering, responding to the failure of idealism and responding to the instrumentalization of reason in traditional or bourgeois philosophies but also as something like a self-critical, self-reflexive stance that in a way is trying to think the wound of not being emancipation or paradise or redemption, but only aspiring to think about it. Mm. And this is something that sounds resignatory, mm. but Adorno says, by the way, this is not resignatory because this is thinking redemption and thinking, happiness for all, but only thinking it. So all the others who try to aspire to, in a way, realize this in thinking, they are the nihilists and they are mm -hmm. the ones having the problem. Mm -hmm. But this also makes critical theory, as I said, maybe not as a, doesn't make it as a sad science, uh, as he also at one point said. <coughs> 
but as an unstable operation or standing somewhere where it's almost impossible to stand. Mm -hmm. Let me just say a few words, but then give you the last. There are no last, last words. <laughs> last words. <laughs> For now, at yeah. least, because I don't want to be. I don't want to. I want to give you the last words for tonight, but I do want to respond to that, okay? Yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, so uh, I, 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 I think that I would want to place this all back into the context of the corrective. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think I can reconcile uh, the, well, no, um, maintain the negativity and not overcome it and not solve it or anything, but at least uh, make, uh, make sense of it. And, 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 and so w your emphasis today on the extreme negativity and on that dark aspect of negative dialectics, I think is essential and we can't, and, and, and essential and important not to uh, abandon, in part because it is precisely the corrective within the Frankfurt School to the drift back to Kant and Hegel, okay? Um, in other words, um, it, it, it functions internally as the way to stop that derive. Um, without, without going outside to the post-structuralists or others, okay? Um, and in that sense, it's, it's a moment that you can't give up because when you, the moment you overcome it or something or you give up on it, in some sense you are headed in a particular direction that has at the end uh, Kant and Hegel, I think. Um, now, um, it's interesting that I find myself in that way rehabilitating Adorno, which I, I didn't expect. Um, I didn't expect because, because to me it is, there, there are questions of sensibility that, um, that have always, for me, posed problems. And, and in part, this notion of the ivory tower-ness and, uh, and the certain remove. And, the difference, for instance, with, with someone, with some of the writings, say, of someone like Foucault, who always, in a way, places himself in the position of the most marginalized uh, in society, whether it's, you know, Hercule Babin or, or, um, or, or uh, you know, uh, Pierre Rivière. And so there's a way in which that sensibility to me, particularly as a as a death row lawyer is far more comfortable. And, and, and so I, I wasn't expecting to be, uh, to be placed in this way, but I, I do see the uh, importance. And, and so now I've, I'm, I'm gonna re completely, I will kind of re completely rethink the, my relationship to these texts and to Adorno in part because it does provide, it does provide in the non-productivity, um, it does provide a gap stop, a, a way to avoid coming out of that uh, dialectical conflict um, uh, uh, much too easily and much too quickly. Um, it's interesting, and, 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 it's, and it's in remaining in that dialectical conflict, I think that there is the affinity to, and so we'll have to do this maybe as another next year, the affinity to uh, Foucault's thought, to post-structuralism, to notions of apor aporias or aporias, right, um, that go on and on and don't and don't end. It's interesting to see. I mean, there are some that do turn to, to Adorno, read Adorno in such a way as to create a, a, a revolutionary impulse. So there are these other readings. I'm thinking of this negativity and revolution 
book uh, edited by John Holloway, Fernando Matamoros, and Sergio Tischler that I was reading, where they write, you know, the movement of negation is a movement that detonates concepts, detonates power, detonates identity, detonates all that is familiar to us. It opens up a frightening, vertiginous, exciting world in which we are forced to question everything around us. The argument is a treading on unsafe ground, a feeling our way forward, an exploration of the world that opens up before us theoretically and practically. So there are these other readings of it that, uh, in terms of the extreme negativity, push that extreme negativity in the direction of kind of a detonating moment. Um, and in part, you know, maybe that's what I was talking about when I said, you know, if, 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 if we prolong that extreme negativity uh, too much, then maybe all there is is praxis. Um, but ultimately, I think for, for today at least, um, I, I will end on the, which I think fits perfectly actually with the negative dialectics, with this idea of wanting to hold on to the non-productivity while at the same time sensing that there is something productive in this path, productive especially today in its being a path of resistance to returns uh, to a more systematic thought that um, I would think are problematic. But I want you to have the last, um, last thought for us. Um, and, um. Mm. We have not yet even posed, you just did implicitly, the question of whether there is a form of practice or politics that would not be derived from or would follow from that kind of theory but that would be in resonance with it. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting idea because it would mean there would not be a relationship of subsumption between them or of a, way a logical implication, but of a constellation, let's say. And I would think of forms of political life or action that would not follow from negative dialectics, but that would in a way take some of its features and realize it in a different realm. And there again, for me, this would be policies, politics of disruption mm. and of disintegration rather than of integration and synthesis. And I think in certain contexts, it makes sense of stressing these forms of action and if you would look for the kind of theory that would, again, be in resonance with it, not follow from it, mm. this would be negative dialectics. Mm. And I like the idea that critical theory defies the seduction to be more, namely to be a theory from which a practice follows. And I like the idea that there could be something like practices that correspond to it, but would not follow from it. And again, I would call them radically or extremely negative, but they would have their own productivity. Mm. But that would be a productivity of a completely different kind. So, Good. thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you all. Thank you all. And, um, I, uh, you know, it, I, my last, m the only thought is we've been surrounded by these <laughs> 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 pictures of Adorno everywhere around us. <laughs> so um, I suppose he was in the room with us uh, this evening. Thank you so much, Martin. Yeah, and thank pleasure. you all. Yeah. Good night, New York. Good night. <laughs>